Today, we're fortunate for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, we have a couple of uh, alumni entrepreneurs in the room. I want to thank uh, Ross Partridge and Joel Brown for being here with us. And um, also encourage you to uh, come down and speak with them afterwards if you'd like to. They're entrepreneurs here um, and, and alums of the University of Michigan, LSNA. And I know about 60% of you are LSNA students too. But what I'm really excited to tell you about is who's speaking today. Uh, Pornima Vijayashankar is a, becoming a serial entrepreneur, co-founder of Mint.com. For those of you who don't know, it's one of the easiest finance tools on the marketplace now. I use it, some of you may. And after, um, after the acquisition of uh, Mint.com by Intuit in 2009, Pornima made a difficult decision to actually go out and, and start a couple of companies herself. She started something called Femgeneer, and she started another company called uh, Busy Bee. And I would like us to welcome her to this stage. I know you'll agree with me that it's great to have her here. Pornima. So, to me, at least I believe that any good entrepreneurial journey, and I say good because I'm just getting started, I'm older than I might look like to most of you, but since I'm just getting started, we'll say good entrepreneurial journey, is really a travel through time where you want to understand why the entrepreneur decided to make the decisions that they decided to make and to then learn from their experience as well. So bear with me as I'm going to have you do a little time travel. And hopefully through that, you'll get a chance to understand how not only I became an engineer, but then transitioned from that into entrepreneurship. So I want to start by going back to 1998. I know many of you were probably learning how to tie your shoelace or learning how to read or write, or even doing something fun like learning how to ride a bike and learning how to write and read. Well, while you were all doing that, I was actually right here. I don't mean on this very stage. I mean, I was actually here at the University of Michigan. And I was here because I was attending a debate camp. And what's interesting is that I'm back here 16 years later, right? So there's clearly a lot of stuff that happened in that period of time that's led me to come back here. So before we get into that, let's go all the way back to 1984. In the year 1984, my parents and I came to the US, and my dad actually started uh, to go to graduate school at a university down the street, Wayne State. He was getting his master's in electrical engineering. But being from South India, you know, the tropics, he spent his first official winter probably ever, here, and after he put one shoe in, I think about like a foot of snow, he pulled it out, his shoe came apart, and he decided it's probably not the place for him to be. So he ended up putting in a transfer and went all the way to San Jose State in California, where he continued his studies. Now, given that my parents were immigrants, they did not have the money to pay for a babysitter, daycare, nanny, any of that stuff. So my dad actually had to take me with him to all of his lectures. And when he, was lecture, when he was listening in on the lectures, I'd be sitting on the floor looking at the squiggly lines and diagrams that were all in his electrical engineering books. And that was actually my introduction to engineering. Now, even though that was my introduction to engineering, and even though I've been a tech geek all my life, I never wanted to be an engineer. I mean, how many of you in here actually want to do the same thing that your parents did, right? Uh, and so for me, watching my dad sitting in a cubicle all day didn't really seem that fascinating, even though I really thought that tech products were pretty cool. For me, I had other, other desires. And actually, when I was six, uh, myself and my friend decided that we wanted to be millionaires before you know, we graduated from high school. Maybe we were young and precocious and knew that the rising cost of college education, or maybe we were just you know, a little greedy at the time. So we decided, being six, that we needed to build a product. Well, the only thing that we knew how to make at the time were popcorn balls. So that was our first product, 
and also being first-time entrepreneurs, but a, a little bit visionary at the age of six, we said, okay, we need to go local before we go global. And so what that meant is we decided that we would walk around our neighborhood, go door to door, and try to sell these popcorn balls. So we spent about a couple weeks trying to go door to door. And at the end of a couple weeks, guess how many popcorn balls we sold? Zero. And I was dejected. And I thought, entrepreneurship is just not for me. I really, I can't sell. And I think I got to do other stuff. Well, being six, of course, I lacked some serious traits that an entrepreneur needs to have, probably persistence, discipline, some level of experience and domain expertise. But at the age of six, I decided, nope, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur. So there I was at six, no engineering, no entrepreneurship. A couple years later, at eight, I decided that I really, really had sort of three careers in mind because that's what I just wanted to do. So I decided, OK, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a lawyer, and I'm going to be a professor, because I love to read, write, and speak. And that was it. I wrote it down in my journal. And then all my activities between 8 and by the time I got to college revolved around that. Now, I still loved math and science, and I learned how to program and did all these things. But to me, my career was going to be a lawyer. And then maybe I'd go on to be a writer and a professor. So when I got to college, I decided that I would major in pre-law. But after endless term papers, I also got frustrated once again. And I decided, no, nope, not going to be a lawyer. I got to do something else. So around this time, I was like, huh, what, like, what can I do? And I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll go take a computer science class. Maybe, you know, because I like, I like machines, and I like computers, and I, I can do some programming. So I took my first computer science class, and I figured out that I really, really loved problem solving. And so after that point, I decided that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an engineer. And after that, I actually ended up also majoring in electrical engineering. And then before I graduated, decided, well, I really wanted to be in the tech capital of the world. So I have to move all the way out from Duke University, where I went to undergrad, uh, to Silicon Valley. And so I've been in Silicon Valley ever since. And so when I moved out there, I was an R&D engineer working at Synopsys. But when I got there, my first couple years, uh, you know, they were good. I was writing code all day and just kind of enjoying a nine to five job, but something in me was missing. And right around this time, my buddy from college, Aaron Patzer, gave me a call and said, you know, I'm really, really frustrated with all the personal finance technology that's out there and all the software products. I feel like there's got to be something easier, especially for people who are young that don't really want to put in the time and the effort to manage all their finances. So I, I think I'm going to start a company and start building a product. And I was like, OK, that's cool. I, I didn't think anything of it at the time. But I told him, you know, just one piece of advice. If, if you're going to do this, then I don't think you should be in Austin, Texas. I think really you need to move out to California, because there's a lot of engineers and there's a lot of capital out here. So you know, think about it. So shortly thereafter, Aaron decided that he wanted to move out to California. And he did. And he started to work on Mint on his own, bootstrapping it. And as he was doing this, you know, he and I would talk. But at the time, I, I didn't see how I could help him, because basically, I was up to my eyeballs in student loans. Uh, and so I, I couldn't quit my day job. And I started to really like the idea. In fact, um, there was one time where we were on a ski trip to Tahoe. Now, mind you, Tahoe is in California. And unlike Michigan, we're not used to this kind of snowfall. So we were in a blizzard on the highway for about eight hours, stuck. And we started to talk about his company idea. And so I asked him this question, you know, what, what are you going to call your company? I haven't heard the name yet. And he said, oh, um, it's going to be called Money Intelligence. And I thought, Money Intelligence? Money intelligence, that's like really lame for young people. I mean, look, there's like Facebook and Twitter. There's all these cool names out there. You got to come up with something better. And he's like, that's all I got. I got money intelligence. I was like, OK. He's like, you come up with something better. So I, I sat there for like a minute. And I thought, what about Mint? And then instantly, Aaron smiled. And he's like, yeah, I love it. Let's go with Mint. Of course, it's pretty hard to get a four-letter domain name. but. We stuck with it. 
And then after that point, I realized that I was becoming more and more invested in this idea. And I wasn't really sure what to do, because I couldn't join him full time. I really needed to stay at my job. So one day, I was sitting in my cubicle at work. And two people came in. One of them was my manager, and another was an HR person. And they said, you know, come with us. So I followed them. And we walked into a conference room. And they said, you know, please sit down. So I sat down. And they said, Pornima, your job has been impacted. And I was thinking, did I get like hit by a meteor or something? What do you mean it's been impacted? And they're like, sorry, you're laid off. And I was like, oh, crap, what am I going to do? And then they're like, oh, uh, well, we're going to give you three months severance. And I was like, three months severance? What is severance? Well, severance ended up becoming my safety net. So I was basically getting paid three months salary to do whatever I wanted. And whatever I wanted was actually take the next you know, car home and start working on Mint. So in a way, it was a little bit of a blessing in disguise for me, and it led me down to my first path, or my first entrepreneurial path. So quickly thereafter, I joined Mint, and Aaron was still bootstrapping it, but he went off to fundraise, and I was building the prototype along with another uh, engineer, Matt, while he was fundraising. And within a couple months, he raised the capital that he needed, and I was able to come on board full time and get the salary that I needed to you know, pay those expensive student loans off. And then basically between 2006 and at the end of 2009, I helped build Mint, scale the product, and at the end of 2009, we ended up getting acquired by Intuit. Well, after the acquisition, once again, I was kind of scratching my head. What am I going to do next? Right? I had been an engineer. I'd been a founding engineer. I wasn't really sure what to do. And I thought, well, you know, I really sucked as an entrepreneur when I was six. But I've learned a few things now having, having been at Mint. I've learned how to be persistent. I've learned how to be disciplined. And I've also learned some more nuances like customer, customer development, product development, even talking to investors and making sure that you know, I can actually scale this business. So I felt confident. And I decided that the next thing for me was to actually go out there and, and be a founder, to actually be an entrepreneur. So of course, when you want to be an entrepreneur, one of the things you need is an idea, right? And at the time, I was kind of wondering what I wanted to build. And I thought, well, you know, there's all these cool technologies coming out and voice recognition and image processing. Maybe I could do something in that. And I thought, but that's just not going to get me out of bed every day. That's not going to keep me excited. Like, what am I really excited about? And one of the things I had been doing up until that point for about six years was yoga. And I thought, well, you know, this yoga thing is really catching on. There's so many businesses, and not only are there so many businesses, but they're worldwide, and they all operate the same. And in fact, they operate a little inefficiently. They should really be using software. And so that's when I started to do some research, and I looked around, and sure enough, they were using software, but not everybody was. And most of the software that they were using was pretty clunky, and people were unhappy with it. What they needed was a really, really simple solution. And fortunately for me, I knew how to build that solution that was simple because I learned that at Mint. So that's when I decided that I was going to start BusyBee. And the point of BusyBee was to provide a really simple way for small businesses like yoga studios to manage themselves and manage their customers. So at the beginning of 2010, I started to build BusyBee. Now, the thing that people don't tell you about when you go from being a founding engineer to a founder is that you're not actually trading one role for another. You're actually trading one role for three roles. And it wasn't until my end of the first year of Busy Bee that I realized this. I read this book by Michael Gerber called The E-Myth. And in that book, Michael talks about how there are three roles that an entrepreneur has to play. He, has to, he or she has to have some technical skills. And by technical, I don't mean you know, writing code or anything like that. I mean, anything can be technical. His example is that the person in it is making pies. The second is that you have to know how to manage people, because you can only initially build a product, and then eventually other people are going to need to build and refine it in order for the business to scale. And then the third is you've got to be the visionary. You've got to be the leader that's actually going to help people advance the business. So these are the three roles. And as a founding engineer, I had an experience in of those. So I slowly had to get my bearings and learn how to play these three roles. And for whatever it was that I was lacking, I would either have to hire people 
or I just have to improve my skills. Now, the other thing that happened as I was bu building BusyBee is I realized that this was my company. And given that it was my company, then I could do things the way I wanted to. And so a couple things that I decided was that I didn't want to take on too much capital. I didn't want to go the VC route, because I'd already experienced that at Mint. Instead, I wanted to bootstrap for as long as possible and maybe take some angel funding. The other thing I wanted was to make it as self-sufficient a product as possible, and I wanted to have a remote team so that I could work from anywhere that I wanted to and work on other projects at the same time. So it took me about three years to lay all this foundation. Now, at the end of 2012, interestingly enough, you know, I was starting to get a lot of requests to come and teach and speak. And I was kind of wondering, you know, well, I'm doing a lot of this stuff, but it's really coming at odds with BusyBee. Now, one of the reasons I was getting a lot of interest was because I had been blogging for, at, at this point, seven years now. So back in 2007, when I started Mint, uh, I really wanted to fulfill that dream of being a writer. And so a lot of my friends were saying, well, you should get into blogging. That's like, that's what all the cool kids are doing. So I started a blog. And at the time, I decided, OK, I'm going to blog about engineering and entrepreneurship, because that's what I've been doing. And I'm going to title the blog Femgineer, because I'm female and I'm an engineer. And maybe other people will see it's kind of cool to be a female and an engineer. At least I'm hoping I'm somebody who's cool. So I started to write about engineering and entrepreneurship. And over the last seven years, I've been keeping that blog. But at the end of 2012, it became really apparent that people really wanted to learn more from me. And they didn't just want to read the blog. They wanted more. So I decided to run a little experiment. And I thought, well, what if I took this blog and made it into a business? So all through last year, I started to develop educational curriculum. And Femgineer, in this past year, has become an educational services company. And basically, what we do is we help tech professionals and tech entrepreneurs build companies and products. And don't let the name fool you. We educate men and women and companies. And the reason that we're doing this is because too often, you know, people can watch a video, watch an inspiring talk like this one, but they're not sure what the next steps are. And having been in place to do that, I wanted to share some expertise. Now, the great thing is that because I set BusyBee up to be this self-sufficient product, I was able to switch gears and start working on Femgineer, which is what I basically do full time at this point. So now we come back to present day, right? Remember I said it's been 16 years since I've been at the University of Michigan. Well, the reason that I got here was because this past summer, I was speaking at a conference called She Codes. And as I was speaking, apparently there was a student in the audience, Natasha Nielsen, wherever you are, hello. Uh, and she saw my talk and decided that she wanted to have me come and speak here. So she invited me to speak, and here I am. So it's been 16 years, and I'm back here. So my point in all of saying all of this is, you know, entrepreneurship is a little bit uncertain. But the other thing is, you know, even if you might discount it like I did at six, you never know when you're going to decide to do it again, right? And there have been many times I even discounted engineering as a career, but I went back to it. So it's OK to sort of make those assumptions that it's not right for you or it's not right right now. That's OK. But think about it in terms of how much freedom and flexibility and also how much uncertainty, but also good things can come about if you decide to go down that path. Thank you. Great to have you here, Pornina. Just want to take a few minutes and ask you a few questions. Sure. Um, Aaron Petzer, uh, who is your friend at university, um, you and he got together and started Mint.com mm -hmm. with another. Uh, can you tell me about that relationship in university? I mean, did you have any expectation at all that you would ever start a company when you were in university with him? Uh, I didn't think I would start it with Aaron. Uh, I know Aaron was going to start a company, because that's all he ever <laughs> talked about in undergrad, and I thought that was really cool. But you know, I never imagined that I would be the one that he was starting it with. Um, so, so yeah, I think for me, I'd gone to Silicon Valley thinking, OK, I'd like to work at a startup maybe in like five years. But it basically happened after a couple years, so I was quite surprised. So, so being an entrepreneur, can you give us What's the thing that you like best about it? And what's the thing you like worst about it? Sure. I think what was really tough in the beginning was, um, you know, and this is me coming from an engineering background, 
where at the end of the day, you know, you can write some code and be like, oh, I built this. But with entrepreneurship, it's like, wow, like a year has passed and I don't really know what's going on. <laughs> so I think there's a level of uncertainty and you can't really put your finger on like, oh, I, I did this because you're doing so many different things. You might be doing some sales, you might be doing some customer support, you might actually be building as well. But given that you're wearing so many different hats, you don't feel like at the end of the day things are done and you can go home. There's just this like feeling of uncertainty and unease, but you've got to get comfortable with that. Um, and so for me, that was a little bit of the, the tricky part. The things I love about entrepreneurship, um, I think, are like I have the freedom to come and speak here, right? If right. I was anywhere else, I'd probably have to be like, um, can I go to can Michigan? I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's always that, that question. Yeah. Um, and also having the flexibility to work from anywhere, to set my own hours. Now, it's a double-edged sword because you really have to still be disciplined, but you, know, you, you are invested in your own idea. Yeah. So, um, Inc. Magazine last year, 2013, named you one of the top 10 women to watch in tech. Um, how, how did you react to that? I, mean, I thought it was great, and then I was like, wow, I got a lot of stuff to do to prove that title. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I certainly didn't take it lightly, and it was, it was yeah. a very nice accolade um, to receive, but then I felt like, oh, I've, I've got to live up to some expectations. Um, in fact, it was kind of funny, because after that, like, some of our busy bee customers were like, there's a bug in this code, like really top 10 women. You know? <laughs> so, so it's like, when, once you start getting into that, you've got to be really cautious about the things that you put, the things that you say, and the products that you build, and really you know, take it to heart, um, not just like, okay, I'm, you know, woohoo, like I'm, I'm, I'm on this, but take it seriously. Yeah, although there's this, there is a psychological principle um, that, you know, as, as, people start to identify you is that you live up to that. I mean, that's the reality. It's like, uh, it's a great honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's kind of a nice, like, gentle push um, yeah. to, to keep you going. So, so can you talk to us a little bit more about Femgineer? I mean, it started in 2007, but presumably then you were knee-deep in building product for Mint.com. So what was happening with Femgineer and uh, then, and then wh where, do you, where do you see it going now? Sure. So yeah, for me it was like this cute little side project. In fact, I didn't think anyone was really reading it. Like, I would write a post probably every week or every month and then really focus on what I was working on at Mint. Um, and then when I started going to some conferences and talks, people were like, oh, yeah, I, I've read your blog. And I was like, oh, people are reading this. Like, I got to take this more seriously. <laughs> um, so then I started to realize, oh, people are actually reading it. Um, and it wasn't, I think, until really like the end of 2012 where I put in a serious amount of effort into making sure that like the content really resonated with the audience and there were takeaways and like really refining. Up until then I was doing some serious stuff and some silly stuff. Like I would write, you know, here's an ode to code poem and it's, you know, things like that, just kind of experimenting. Um, and so now, like given a full year has gone by, we've had um, a number of online classes that we've taught uh, and I've spoken a lot. Uh, and for me, I, I want it to be an education services company. Um, and really what I want to help people um, with is that transition from engineer to entrepreneur wow. um, or someone who is coming in and saying, I want to be a tech entrepreneur and what does that look like? Because um, the, hard, the hard part is people have an idea, but how do you actually manifest that into a product or a service? What are the steps? And what are all the learnings? And I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. And the tricky thing is like, you know, they do something and they're like, this is really hard. And you're like, no, no, it's, it's supposed to be hard. Like, keep, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Um, so yeah. giving them that level of encouragement in addition to a structured curriculum. And so, so um, you're, you're through Femgineer, you're basically running uh, courses mm -hmm. for uh, would-be entrepreneurs literally around the world, right? Yeah, so we, we're running courses online. We have events that we do locally or across the U.S. And the whole focus is we want to help these tech professionals you know, build products but also understand how to build companies. So this, uh, this nexus between I want to build a product and I want to bring it to market. So what's, what's, the, um, what's the thing that Femgineer is doing most to help people kind of bridge that gap? Yeah. So I think there's two critical points. The first is people that you know, have that idea that they've been simmering on from anywhere from like six seconds to six years. And it's just really hard for them to get it out of their head 
and even take it to the next level, which is telling a potential customer about it, and maybe even asking that customer for a dollar, even though they haven't built anything yet, right? So how can we empower them to get it out of their head and get it out the door? Uh, so I think that's a really critical step that we're helping people with. Uh, now, some people are far, further along where they might have actually built a prototype or they may even have some revenue coming. And for them, the next stage is, okay, how do I make this into a business? And that's another drop-off point where they might have gotten some validation, but they're not sure, you know, how do we keep attracting customers? How do we keep track of metrics? Do we go and raise funding or do we bootstrap this? And so we help them uh, by educating them on all of those points as well. Right. So, I mean, it's comp complementary to some of the the uh, the problem you're trying to solve with BusyBee, right? I mean, you have these yoga studios, they're giving a good service, but the sort of concept behind it and some of the fundamentals of how you run your business right. were, were lacking. So so what's interesting to me about um, BusyBee is you start with yoga studios, yep. right? I mean, this is, this is not the place that I would have started, but I don't do Bikram yoga. Sure. Um, what's, what's the market like for yoga studios and how did you choose you, you know, you like it, but how did you choose that, and how do you see that as the potential place to start and grow your business for BusyBee? Sure. Well, since the 70s in the U.S., yoga has only been on the rise. In fact, in the next five years, there are supposed to be a million instructors, just, just instructors. That's not even including studios and all of that. Um, so today, there's probably 20 to 30,000 studios, but a lot of people don't have studios, and they're just operating their businesses. Uh, and that's been going on since the 70s, so it's only been on the rise. It's not what people think is a new trend, even though it might seem like that. Uh, so, I, so I knew that going in. Um, and then the other piece of that is there are so many at different aspects. So there are people that want to set up a studio. There are people that want to teach at home. There are people who want to just do retreats. And seeing all of the different kinds of businesses I realized like, this market is only going to increase. Um, and not only that, but there's an aging population, there's people that have high anxiety, and yoga helps with that. So there are some deep-rooted health benefits to this kind of business, and I only see more and more cropping up. Um, the other piece is, you know, we have a competitor in the market who's done very well, and, and there's a couple others like that, but there's not a whole lot. Um, and I think it's having that insight where, okay, I have been practicing yoga, I see the market, and not a lot of people get it, but that's because they don't have, you know, the 10 years of knowledge that I have. Um, so sometimes you want to look for those little niches that other people wouldn't think of um, and wouldn't necessarily get involved in. But, but Busy Bee starts with yoga, but it doesn't necessarily end with yoga. Exactly, right. And that's the other thing is, like, I knew... Um, we'll start there, we want to build some loyalty in a particular niche, and then we can grow from there. But truthfully, you know, CrossFit, Pilates, dance studios, Tai Chi, they all operate very, very similar as businesses. So that's where I knew that there was going to be even more potential. So can you talk to us about your decision of bootstrapping? First of all, what's bootstrapping? Sure. Yeah, so bootstrapping is basically you either... Um, uh, well, you basically rely on yourself for funding, and you can do that either through savings, you can do that through customers, like actually getting revenue in the door, um, but it's basically taking no outside investment. Uh, and so the first year and a half that I was running BusyBee, um, I, I used a lot of my savings. We took in a little bit of angel investment uh, at, the end, at the middle of second year. An angel investment is... Angel investment, yeah. An angel investment is basically individuals who have high net worth, so not venture capitalists um, who are you know, taking money from a number of institutions, kind of like Michigan. Um, but they're investing, angels invest their own personal savings. Um, so we took some, some capital from people that I knew, um, either from Mint or new people I'd met, and, uh, and then built out more of the product. Um, and then towards the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, um, you know, there was a lot of buzz going on about the Series A crunch. And I knew it was going to be a problem for us uh, for two reasons. The first is we um, were operating a very niche business, right? We were not kind of the mainstream tech company that people wanted to invest in. Um, and the second was we also didn't have the numbers that people wanted. You know, they wanted to see like 
50, 100K in monthly revenue and we weren't there. We were still VCs. VCs, yes. Okay. Venture yes. capital firms. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Those are the numbers they wanted to see. We didn't have those yet because we were still really building out the product and we were still acquiring customers and trying to figure out our um, thesis around that, like come up with a formula. So given that I knew I'd have to go back to bootstrapping and that this would be a slow growth company, but I was okay with that. I was like, I'm not in a rush. And the other part is, um, that made it even harder was there was slower market adoption, right? People are just getting used to using technology in their personal lives and then figuring out how to use it for their businesses. So a lot of what we had to do in the last three, four years is just educate them on the importance, um, whether they use our product or not, but it's like, hey, use Facebook for your business or use Twitter for your business. And then yeah, it would be great if you would use us as well. Um, but we've had to have that kind of discourse to just even get them using the technology before they can use our product. Right. So I want to give an opportunity for students to ask you questions as well. Can you, but before I do that, can you um, share, if you had one bit of advice for students sitting here interested in maybe starting their own companies, what would it be? Yeah. Um, so if you are not someone who has like had a successful lemonade stand, uh, or any kind of business in the past, and you're really apprehensive about it, but you, you know that's kind of what you want. You know, you want the freedom and the flexibility. Then I would say start it on the side. You know, I didn't even realize what I was doing when I came up with Femgineer, but it's been great that I, I did that as a side project. And I didn't know what I was doing when I was going to yoga. I just like thought it was a hobby, but it was great that I started it on the side. So if there's something like that, think about how you can invest even a couple hours a week to getting getting it going. Um, and, and it does a couple things for you. The first is like if you're someone who's not very risk tolerant, then you'll start to slowly, you know, develop that because you're seeing how it's making progress and you can always like shut it down if you're not interested in it. Um, and the second thing is it'll kind of force you to figure out, well, what, what point do you need to get, at, get to to where you are comfortable? Um, so I remember like the Spanx CEO that's like now a billion dollar company, um, she said she needed to get to like a million dollars in run rate a year before she felt comfortable about leaving her day job. Because right. um, up until that point, I don't know if she was a single mom or something like that, but she just felt like, you know, I need to be able to pay the rent successfully before I can do this. So don't feel like you got to drop out of school and move to Silicon Valley or any of that stuff. Like you can start to make a small amount of progress even right now. Um, but the key is to have that discipline and to have that commitment, even if it's just a little bit. Great. So let's, let's turn on the lights and um, get the mics out. Uh, those of you who'd like to ask questions, just make sure you put your hand up uh, high enough so that we can see it. We've got a question up here. Um, there are not a lot of female engineers in engineering school, and there are quite a lot of engineers, female engineers who aren't in the field either. And a lot of female engineers tend to, like, you know, drop out of the engineering field. So what kind of advice do you have for an aspiring female engineer and you know, where should she go with her career? Sure. Well, the first is she should go to Femgineer so she gets all the support that she needs. <laughs> and we can help her through the initial stages all the way to the, wherever her career takes her. Um, and the second thing I would say is, at least for me getting started, like. Yeah, I mean, I knew that there weren't a lot of women in my classes. When I did high school debate, there weren't a lot of women in that either. So I just kind of took it as like, that's how it was, you know? And if I was really interested and dedicated, then I would stick around, right? Um, and so I know that can, be, that can still be a little bit of a challenge. Um, but, you know, make sure that you make a commitment to yourself that this is something that's of interest to you. Uh, so that's the first. And then I think the second is um, if you feel like you're not in the, the right environment, you're probably right. You're probably not in the right environment. So realize that there's a lot of mobility, right? There's a lot of different tech companies. There are those that are really big. There are those that are small. There are those that have very open organizations. There are some that have closed. There are those that care about mentoring and career development. And then there are those that are it's like really results oriented. So figure out the kind of environment that you need to be in in order to be productive and to be happy and to put that level of research into 
even the interview process, right? So to ask questions and to do you know, some due diligence when you're looking at companies. I know that's hard you know, even in your first job because you just want to get that first job, but even if you can ask simple questions like, hey, is there any mentorship here and what does that look like? Or like, has anybody been promoted or is there any sort of flexible time? Right? Those kinds of questions can be helpful for you to gauge. Um, and then the other thing I would say is build up your support system. And that's kind of why I was joking about Femgineers. I'm not just saying go there, but think about all the different organizations out there today that are looking to support women, uh, whether it's in a form of like having a women's hackathon or providing mentoring or providing um, even scholarships. But take advantage of those resources because there is a lot that's being offered. And I think there's even a point now where there's more being offered than what's being taken. Um, so don't miss those opportunities. And I know it's hard because in the back of the mind, you're like, oh, but I feel so guilty. Or like, oh, they're just giving this to me because I'm a woman. Like, so what? You know, <laughs> like, just take, make use of it. Like, when somebody scratches a lottery ticket, they're not like, I don't deserve this. Like, I didn't hold the door open for somebody today. You know, they're just like, yeah, I'm cashing in, I'm getting my money, right? So same thing, like, you deserve it. It doesn't, doesn't really matter um, what you think or how you necessarily might feel icky about it. Other questions? My question was, um, for your website, to have, there are so many other websites like that, what strategy did you use to make a better product than your competitions? Which one? Mint. Mint. Yes. Yeah, so the, there, there were two really important things that we did. We did a number of other things, but there were two really important things that we did at Mint. Um, the first is simplicity in the product itself. So right around the time that we um, were developing our prototype, this was like the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, we had a number of other competitors come out into the space. But none of them were doing what we were doing, which was automating the way transactions were being downloaded from banks into Mint account. Everyone else was doing like, oh, take your Excel spreadsheet and upload it here, or copy and paste this and that, and that was just a really clunky experience for the users, and as a result, they didn't see the growth that we did. So the first was just making a really simple product that delighted users. The second is we were all 20-somethings. So who's gonna trust 20-somethings with their credit card bank information, right? Uh, so we put a lot of effort into the brand that we were creating. And that meant we had to talk a lot about security. We went out and hired a security expert to be our VP of engineering. Um, and we also made the, the product look as polished as possible so that people would not only feel comfortable in terms of what we were saying, but they would also see that in the product itself. So there was a level of branding that we put in place. Um, so I feel like the one-two punch was building a solid product that was easy to use and also having compelling branding and messaging. Great. So we have time for a couple more questions. So my question for you is, you know, in the last uh, couple of years in your entrepreneurial journey, did you ever hit a low point? And if so, how did you push through that? Yeah. I had a, 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 it was at the end of 2012. Um, and there were a couple factors. So, you know, obviously this like Series A crunch was very you know, disheartening. Um, and then right around the time, we had uh, launched our second product at BusyBee, which was this billing solution. And we were really proud of it, because we were streamlining the way that people were going to get paid. So businesses could collect credit card, uh, money from credit cards, and then within one to two days, they could get paid out, which is something that they need, because they need to stay cash flow positive. So we were really proud about building this product. Well, it turns out, um, when you build something to benefit one group, another group decides to take advantage. So within a couple months of launching this, we saw this great spike, and we thought, hey, we're going to hit you know, break even, possibly profitability in six months, and we're really on, on good track. Uh, but then a month or two later, I got a couple phone calls from Australia saying, you know, who's busy B and why are you guys charging $300 to my credit card? I was like, y you must be mistaken. Like, did you go to yoga? You know, did you go to the gym? And they're like, no. I don't exercise. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? So I dug in a little deeper. Turns out there were a number of people that were using BusyBee as a money laundering scheme. And we had 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we had, mind you, we, you know, I learned my lessons at Mint. I put in a lot of security. I put in a lot of protection. But it was, despite all of that, people still managed to game the system. And that's, that was the time where it was like, well, you know, you're trying to do some good in the world, and people are misusing it. And you're also really like, you know, bootstrapping and trying to make progress. And now you've got, you know, a large amount of debt that you've got to pay back. So I was just like, is this, gonna, is this even going to work out, right? Like, I, I was afraid that we were going to go down a road of, like, you know, bankruptcy or something like that. Um, fortunately, you know, we managed to make enough money to make ends meet and pay everybody back and, you know, fine-tune the product. Um, but it was one of those moments where, you, you know, you kind of question the work that you've done and the quality of it um, and whether you're fit to be, like, leading people. So that was probably one of the darkest moments that I had. Thank you. I was kind of wondering, I'm not an engineer, but I have entrepreneurial spirit. I was wondering what it takes to make a successful blog. It takes, this is generic, it takes great content. But by that, I don't mean like stuff it with like, S, you know, search terms and stuff like that. You really have to have um, first something to say. And it doesn't matter what you have to say, right? Just something to say and, you know, Pick what your voice is going to be. You don't have to fabricate it. Like, have it be what you want. So, like I said, when I first got started, I wrote silly things like Ode to Code or, um, you know, here's, like, what I'm doing in my Rails app. And I just kind of built it from there. Um, but have your interests and your passions guide you in what you write um, and, and make sure that what you're conveying to people is what you're interested in. Um, because I think too often people try to do the opposite where they're like, hmm, what does this audience want? Let's like, you know, exactly craft that. And then it just ends up become, sounding really generic. But what people want to hear is, what did you try? What did you do? How did you fail? How did you, you know, fix that? And what were some of the takeaways from that experience, right? And that can be in any context. It can be, hey, I traveled to, you know, Asia and I you know, had my wallet stolen, and here's how to protect against that, right? It can be anything, but the key is pick what your theme is going to be, tell your stories, and really leverage your experience. Um, and that's how you build, at least initially, a great blog. And then the second piece is, you know, make sure people know about it. So um, I didn't do a lot of work these past couple years because I had built an audience over seven years. But now, if you were to get started, you know, there's a lot of people blogging. So you've really got to get the word out about it and tell people what it is and have them understand how it's unique um, and c continue to write. It's not like you can just write one day and you're done. You've got to keep it going in order for them to see that you are actively contributing um, and that you care about this. Did you get any resistance? I was just wondering, follow up, like on to what you said in your blog. Do I get any resistance? I think now that I've been um, a little bit pushier on the women in engineering issue, I've certainly gotten some resistance. Um, but for other things, people are just like, yeah, thanks for sharing. Like I wrote a post recently highlighting some key steps on how to bootstrap, and people were like, thanks for sharing it, because there's not a lot of content about that. Um, and that was the other thing is like thinking about unique experiences that I had had, whether it was in business or whether it was in engineering, that other people might not have experienced or even might not even have the guts to talk about. Like a lot of people don't have the guts to like even say, hey, being a woman engineer is difficult or being an entrepreneur is difficult and here are some of the like sticky points that happen. So the more you can kind of expose yourself uh, in a story format with some strategies for people, it's also key. So um, some of you might not realize it, but um, today <clears throat> through the weekend, uh, we're having University of Michigan is having the largest student-run hackathon ever, and it's being held in Detroit. Uh, yeah, you can applaud to that. <laughs> um, and the keynote speaker the kicking it off is Pornima tonight. So I'd encourage uh, those of you to support that. Pornima, uh, start with what I said at the beginning. We're really fortunate to have you here at the University of Michigan. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Let's, uh, thank you.